Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome audience to the Talking Dean podcast. I'm your host Majid and today I have with me some very special personalities of my co-hosts brother Rash and brother JK. Um, you'll uh, recognize brother JK from the Talking Sira podcast and also we have a very special guest uh, brother Imran Munir aka Sim the founder and the host of the Mad Mamluks podcast podcast and definitely uh, I'd have to say it's uh, in the definitely in the top five Islamic podcast in the world at the moment so subhanallah it's an honor to have uh, you on uh, brother Sim and thank you Zakla Khair for inviting me I, it's a tremendous honor I spoke to brother Majid for a while before he started this podcast and I was so happy to see him succeed with his effort because a lot of people sometimes just get the idea trapped in their head and they never launch but alhamdulillah you guys are consistent and following through with your efforts yeah subhanallah we, we, we're trying uh you know it's been a bit uh since the podcast has been going it's been about a year now and uh you know i remember sim when we spoke uh, a while back and uh and you know that to be honest with you that was a motivation for me the fact that you know when you when you said you know let's see how it goes because many people start and they drop out so you know in in yourself uh, it's it's a challenge that you set yourself as well that you don't want to be like the many and you want to be like the few uh, right. because in reality it's only the few that really stick to it and uh, alhamdulillah I got a great team around me anyway uh, yeah. you know brother rash and brother jk uh, also he's the, the main man on the talking serial podcast as well if you have a time if you ever have time uh, same check that out as well uh, I will, inshallah. Yeah, man. So, so you know, our listeners, they may recall that um, when I mentioned, actually, when we were recording our first podcast during the lockdown. And what I mentioned was that uh, we were supposed to have Sim <laughs> on that podcast. But at the time, uh, it wasn't possible because uh, of the lockdown restrictions in Chicago. Uh, so, so, Sim, what's the situation in Chicago now in, in regards to the lockdown? Is it easing up? Yeah, so... Illinois is, well, uh, is the state that uh, Chicago resides in. Uh, there's uh, obviously for international listeners, there's 50 states in the United States. And Illinois is one of the few states who are, is actually following the federal guidelines before opening up the, the uh, facilities and everything related to uh, the lockdown. Um, so things are much more slower in opening up in Illinois and Chicago than the other states. Whereas many of the other states have opened up their gyms and everything, mm. Chicago has not. Uh, Chicago has many multiple different phases that it's opening things up with. And uh, it seems like <clears throat> there's going to be outdoor dining and things like that that's going to be available to the public within a couple of days. So. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. So, so things are getting back to the, well, I won't say back, but things are getting to the new normal, yeah? Yeah, it'll be the new normal until the uh, the numbers spike again, and mm. they're gonna have to lock down again. It's just it seems like it's gonna be a back and forth game to control the numbers, unless uh, if the numbers don't actually uh, increase and and hit their max peak, then uh, we'll probably be at this new normal. But from what someone described to me, I think this description was apt. The only reason they're lifting up the lockdown is that they have available hospital beds for you if you do end up getting sick. So um, that's, I and guess, prob- the probably, Yeah, and probably even in addition to the fact that the economic problem is g- getting larger than the kind of the health problem at the moment. Without a doubt, without a doubt. There's so many uh, things that are being impacted related to the lockdown and there's much debate to be had regarding that, regarding what is, uh, whether the lockdown is actually beneficial, whether it's doing more harm than good because of all the uh, consequences that are happening as a result of it that are not related to COVID-19, but um, let's just say people not getting the annual health checkups and uh, any other resources that have been tied up to COVID-19 that would have otherwise been helped to other resources or issues at hand so 
Yeah, subhanAllah. Well, inshallah, hopefully things get back to normal anyway. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of stuff cracking off uh, in America at the moment. Uh, and this is the reason why we wanted to do the podcast. Uh, in a way, it, short notice to a certain degree because of what's, what's going on. We know that, you know, uh, on the 27th, there was the, uh, the video that went viral about George Floyd being uh, murdered. You'd have to say he was, he was murdered in front of the public uh, by a police officer called Derek Chauvin. I think that's how you, you know, pronounce it. He held him yeah. down with his knee. And since then, you know, things really have kicked off. There's uh, protests, there's rioting, there's looting. And, and once again, the, the question of um, racism in, in America has, you know, come back to the forefront. So, you know, that's why we thought, Sim, uh, because you're, you're from, you resi- reside in America, you know, wanted to get your uh, perspective, you know, get your, uh, your thoughts on what's, what's going on. And then we can, you know, discuss wider issues to do with racism, capitalism. But what's your, your first your initial thoughts yeah. of, of what's kicking off? So, so what's right now we're seeing for the international audiences who don't, who don't really understand the scope of what's happening is uh, there's about 40 major cities in the United States uh, have had widespread uh, protests and in some cases um, some rioting has been, been involved, some uh, property damage, looting. Um, and it's important that people understand the differences between all these different layers of protests because it's all being kind of grouped into one. Yeah. And do we understand that, uh, as Maja described, uh, there, there's that the officer who put down his knee on that uh, Michael Floyd, or I'm sorry, George. On, on, on that gentleman, uh, on his neck. And that wasn't just a... Uh, that was actually something that is part of their routine. If you look in their Minnesota's um, engagement handbook, in, in the police handbook how that, that explains how to engage with criminals, mm. that is actually something that is written in there. That, that is a, a form of subduing someone mm. during an arrest. Mm. So it, it brings to mind, well, how was this was this will this cop actually be prosecuted or will he actually be convicted for this crime because according to the letter of their handbook he's actually following the the procedures or protocol that they laid out for him and it's important to understand it's not that 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 wasn't uh, an outrageous and heinous act it was horrifying in every way but this is actually written in the rules of engagement with uh with mm. subduing or making arrests and things like that. Mm. So it was interesting from my perspective to, to find that out uh, and find out when, when they are uh, issuing an arrest and, you know, charging him with third degree murder, third degree murder means like it's not um, a premeditated uh, crime and things like mm. that. It's, it's like different right, okay. layers of the serious offenses. First it's not degree homicide. Murder in the it's United not States. homicide. Yes. Right. Um, so we, we understand that there is some, uh, placating to the public happening and hmm. normally the, he wouldn't have been charged. He, he probably would have gone free as other officers have in the past. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying I agree with this by, by in, in any sense. I'm not saying that he should, you know, um, get off or anything like this, but what yeah. I, I really want people to understand is that these are rules of rules of engagement that have been laid out for officers to engage with the public in this inhumane manner. And this officer was really just following what he was trained with, you know? I, th- I think yeah. the issue, Sim, is more to do with the fact that the guy wasn't resisting. You know what I mean? I think, yeah, I think, yeah. That, he I think wasn't. that's the point. Yeah. yeah, but I think that... He wasn't resisting. He was, he was clearly explaining to the officer that I can't breathe, hmm. you know, he's... Uh, there's many other, not forget about him. There's other bystanders who are watching uh, th- this take place and they're to explain to the officer, hey, ease up on him. They, the owner, the person who actually called the police because they thought that he was using some kind of counterfeit money, uh, yeah. he called up the owner of the store. He said, you know, I'm, they're, they're, they're killing this guy. They're, what should I do? So the, the clerk at, at the store, he's calling the, the owner of the store. And he's saying, I don't know what to do. These officers are 
killing this guy. Um, so the, this is the uh, the setup or what what led to uh, Floyd um, essentially getting killed by the police officer. Now, yeah, the other thing that I've noticed from and just reading from the media is that. Uh, some of the narrative in the media or those like even from the police uh, department is that, um, you know, this chap, George Floyd, he had uh, underlying health conditions. And um, although, like you said, you know, they were following protocol and process. Um, and there is, there's this argument that the actions of Derek Chauvin, the police officer, isn't what it was part of it, but it isn't the reason this uh, Floyd uh, d died. It was due to his underlying health conditions. So that's an interesting kind of narrative on the whole well, situation. And, and that's a very good point you brought up, JK, because what does a system do when it first sees a dissent, ferment, um, um, protests, things like that? There's standard operating procedures related to how systems operate when, when they see um, protests uh, and, and some, any kind of disruption happening. It's first to discredit, right? Yeah. Mm. Discredit, um, disunite, cause yeah. divisions within the movement or protests, and, and further um, isolate or, or show the, the worst uh, possible um, representatives of the movement mm. to say, hey, you know what? This is what that, that movement is about. So you see what, what you were first talking about, right? You were, yeah. you were talking about them saying that, hey, this isn't what really happened, right? They're trying to discredit the movement or yeah. the protests. Like, the, you're, you're, you're seeing pancakes in, in the air, it's, or the flying spaghetti or whatever. You're not, you're not what, what you're seeing is not actually happening. So they're trying to discredit the, the, the whole notion of what's actually happening yeah. or denying the existence of, of racism that, hey, you know what? This only happens in certain pockets of society. It's not necessarily uh, that it happens to everyone, right? Um, and then there is the idea of um, showing the worst of the protests yeah, to society. Yeah. So when you go turn on CNN, you don't see any of the peace. Ninety nine percent of the, the the protests that have been happening have been peaceful. But what you see is protests across LA or in Minnesota, and you see warehouses burning and streets being looted. Those are very small sectors of what the protests ha have transpired to. And many people who I know who have been on the ground, they've called me and said, hey, Sim, I've seen these violent individuals come and take, take over the rally. They come in in droves, and we, all the peaceful people end up having to uh, you know, move over to the next street over, or they have to get out of their way. And the these other people with other objectives in mind, causing property damage, chaos, mayhem, these, these people are ending up getting all the, the spotlight. In some instances, they've even seen um, bricks and other uh, materials that are used to cause uh, damage to property get out for them while they're, so that it's been like a stack of bricks would be laid out by, um, by unknown individuals mm, very right. early morning. Someone would come at night and drop off a big pile of bricks. Wow. Right in front of the courthouse or something or, or a government building. And the, the protesters are, are looking at the camera and saying, we're, we know what you're trying to make us do with this and we're not going to fall for it. Mm. So these are the reasonable protesters that, that they won't show you in the media. The mainstream media won't talk about it. You'll find it in Twitter streams and things like that. But um, we have to understand how the system is culturing the mind of, of, of society and saying like, Hey, this is, these aren't people who are really people who want change. These are people who want to steal, rob, loot. They won't want to take advantage of uh, the horrible situation that we have right now with COVID-19 by wearing masks and things like that and, and take advantage. So, so there's that layer, right? And there, there's a layer of the protesters themselves. Well, who are they comprised of, right? There are people who uh, among the protesters who are um, just horrible individuals who are taking advantage of the situation. There are people who um, don't necessarily care at all about um, racism or any of the issues related to structural oppression or racism. The, there's just people who are 
board at home. They're, they're, they're just not going to, they're not there. Uh, they're seeing a lot police resources being directed towards these press and they're saying, oh, well, the police are guarding all these peaceful protesters. While they do that, we're going to go ahead and take advantage of the unguarded uh, infrastructure that is related to retail and... Uh, you Ross, know, I've seen that, uh, that, that video that you shared on Twitter with that, you know, that shop. Yeah. I think it might have been a mobile shop and stuff and the, guy was, the owner was standing there and that was sad to see. I think doesn't this expose also the the whole idea of protests in general and how they're a, a means that don't really achieve the objectives that, you know, the whole concept of peaceful protesting, whilst it sounds quite fanciful and that is going to create some degree of change, how often do actual peaceful protests even instigate a degree of change, especially when, you know, there are people who are so willing to dive in and utilise mob mob mentality to cause anarchy and chaos and stuff like that and actually detract from the very thing people are you know probably standing together shoulder to shoulder to try and promote in the first place yeah, well, yeah. many notable ideologues throughout um the 20th century the some of the brightest philosophers and thinkers have, have said that peaceful protests uh, you know they they're not completely uh useless but they don't really instigate the change that you want to take place in society. But uh, now I'm not, I'm not necessarily advocating violence, but I'm saying that when you want uh, people to take notice, um, you want change to really take place. Unfortunately, the, the human psychology is built towards recognizing um, eminent or, or, or power, right? We are, when people have, organized and massed and 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 are displaying power and you know are showing resistance by utilizing uh whatever they have at their means uh, you know whatever they can use to uh you know push yeah. back at uh, the power structures then the, the system will say oh you know what i'm going to figure out a way to accommodate whatever the requests that they have now the system did you ever watch the Matrix? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Matrix. Who was it? You know how they, how they make adjustments. Mm. You yeah. know how they, they, they the the Matrix, uh, uh, the agents and and whatnot. They they make adjustments to the system. So what what they'll do in in this situation? Well, yeah, they're, they're going to take enough change will take place just to uh, to people. put the public on, under the boiling point. To yeah. control their, their they, they might introduce some legislation related to um, engagement with the police training and tactics and things like that. You know, police may may need to uh, have a, a better form of, of uh, training procedures and things like that. There might be some reviews like this that are thrown their way. But the idea of institutional racism that's happening, structural racism, mm -hmm. That will not change. And if these protesters have, um, if, if their goal is only just um, the engagement with police, then it, the, the movement has, has completely fallen apart at its core. It's, that it's, it's, a, it's flawed at its core because it's not really addressing the main components that are causing uh, black Americans uh, other other minorities to to fail and and another thing that the, the while I'm on the topic of race, race is that mm -hmm. this idea of um, when we, I was talking about disuniting the movement many of this many of the things that are related to race are coming up what, what do I mean by that well why are there white protesters among the black protesters you, you see that question popping up all over Twitter well, so, so what what if they are why? Why can't white, white, uh, young white uh, men yeah, they and women yeah, yeah, who yeah, yeah, yeah. the injustice? Why can't they they come in and show their um, show their hatred for what they saw with the Floyd killing? Well, why is it that me as an Indian or you or anyone else with their various ethnicities come and join in solidarity against the injustice that happened with Floyd? So, 
this is another thing that that creeps up by disuniting the movement and causing um, people to say, "Oh, you know what? This is just a black issue. You, none of you are, are allowed to talk about it." And there will be people within even the black community who will say this stuff, and there'll, uh, you know, there will be black people who will also say, "You know what? Everyone's welcome too." But the people who will get the voice are the people who are saying, "Hey, hey." You're not allowed to talk about this. You're Arab or you're Indian or you're Latino. You're not. You're not allowed to talk about our issues. So they they try to cause division among a movement that is trying to build momentum and trying to show the system uh, some display of force that hey we are a force to be reckoned with. And yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. What, what, no, what, one what I think is really interesting point you made about um, non-blacks supporting uh, you know black lives matter or whatever movement it may be uh, whether it be the floyd issue or all the previous issues that you know this isn't something new you know it's been going on for a while and you could say for even be up beyond uh, you know the movements the modern movements we have now mm. but w- one thing that's interesting is that when it comes to um these uh, you know these protests uh, uh, you know, it's interesting that you spoke about how it's being controlled, and there's there's some sort of maybe some insidious efforts to um, make it violent. Um, but one thing that I was thinking about is that it's quite understandable uh, to see protests become violent or aggressive, and that you know when it there, there seems to be some sort of cycle. So initially, you know, they may try uh, peaceful protest because that's the the initial kind of let's speak out against it. But when you continually see that there's no impact in this activity or it doesn't lead to any change, as we've seen, you know, this issue seems to be a weekly occurrence. Mm-hmm. And actually only when it's captured on camera does it come to the forefront. But it must be going on behind, mm-hmm. you know, when the cameras aren't being shown, right? Um, so it's, it's a societal issue. But if you're continually seeing that there's no change happening through peaceful protests, it's all, always going to be automatic that you move on to the next stage which is becoming a bit more aggressive uh, and then moving on to actually violence. And, and you know, then, then it goes on to looting and fire. And you do start questioning some of the motives. But I think there is some, un- you know, it's understandable why there's so much anger, even if we don't agree with the whole matter of protests. You, you can't really take it away from those who are being impacted in these uh, communities oh, 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 oh. that action. JK, we have to just parse out what we mean by violent protests and because there's, it can mean a lot of different things to many different people. So there's the uh, protests that are happening against the police, right, where uh, protesters have started throwing rocks and you know, damaging police vehicles and things like that. That's one component. But then yeah. there's also the other component of looters who are damaging private property. And exactly, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, committing theft and things like that. So we have to isolate. What happens is violent protests kind of get lumped in together with the looters and yeah. often gets discredited. There is legitimate forms of protests that are violent, not and but still kind of peaceful in the sense that they're just damaging uh, police property, but not really harming the police officer's health and safety, you know? So in that respect, like you'll see all over Twitter or social media, you'll see a lot of these vehicles being damaged and things like that. But you'll, none of those officers have actually been hurt. Um, yeah. Those were the, those were police properties that were uh, left on certain streets, and protest, protesters took advantage of them being unoccupied. Right. So um, it's just important to make that distinction, just because people kind of end up lumping everything together and discrediting um, the violent protests themselves. And by violent, we don't mean killing or, you know, um, hurting specifically, but it's more like the the Palestinian rock throwing type of protest, right? There's just, it's not really hurting or maiming anyone. Um, Quite the opposite. The the police officers themselves, there's a laundry list of, of how much, um, actual injuries they've caused to people. The, a reporter, a television uh, photojournalist or something from, I can't remember what exact the agency she's from, she lost her eye. She She's permanently blinded mm-hmm. by a, a bullet that they fired. I don't know if it was a rubber bullet or a paintball, but mm-hmm. 
Something I saw like a that. video with paintball. I saw one video of yeah. one guy firing paintballs at uh, journalists. Right, right. And, and you're seeing... <laughs> it's so fun to see um, mainstream media get a pie in their face, you know? When you saw the CNN reporters getting arrested by their own you know, apparatus. These are... CNN is, is just a tool that's used by the government institutions to control the their narrative and and uh, seeing them get arrested and then later on the governor of the state apologized to cnn like we didn't mean for this to happen they you know that it was just uh, an in incidental consequence of what they were trying to accomplish normally they would never you know mm -hmm. uh stir or have problems with cnn because cnn upholds what their narrative is you know they're going to give them the platform the uh the message that they want to relay to the to the masses, right? So it's like it's like you said, though. Um, um, like some of the mainstream media will give us a narrative, and especially us here in the UK, uh, we will get that narrative. You know, always on on the, on the when you turn on the news now, it will talk about the violent protests and the looting, yeah. and we'll try to discredit uh, all, all what's happening there and uh, show that it's just you know yob yob mentality. Um, but um, I think the, the important distinction or the comparison you made with the Palestinians was quite good in that even in Palestine, anyone who kind of has shows some sort of aggression towards Israel is deemed to be the, cri the criminals, the terrorists, uh, rather than viewing it as they're the ones that are being victimized and, and oppressed. But you, but know, sure we'll go you know, the, I'm just going to say, Jacob, that the protest you're saying, you know, the, the thing is that the fact that the fact that racism has been going on for, for a while, right? The fact that we've had, you know, you had the, the King issue years ago, you had the Arbery, uh, Ahmed Arbery issue not long ago. The thing is that, you know, if, if people are affected by this, whether they're black or, or just say the, you know, the minority people, right? The thing is, though, would you not, uh, would you not say the fact, that, the fact that they vent their anger, whether it's uh, peacefully or with a bit of violence, right? I'm not even talking about the looters. Let's not even bring the looters into this because they're on their own flex, right? So the people that are uh, uh, protesting, they're protesting against the police. They're damaging police property. Mm. But the problem of racism, right, is something which is far beyond the police, mm. right? Mm. In reality, you've got, uh, you've got the commander-in-chief of America right now who's a blatant racist, right? Mm. So the, the problem is a societal issue. This is something which is institutional, right? And what happens is that if they are then just, the anger goes against the police, and like Sim said, they make a bit of tweaks in the legislation, you know, about how you can behave and whatever. And then as if the hundreds of years of racism has disappeared. You know, what I'm trying to say it's, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle, which if the problem isn't addressed, then nothing's going to change, especially not by these protests. Absolutely. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. And, and I think one of the main issues, just like the other Palestinians, when we were talking about... Uh, yeah. How the Palestinians, uh, how they changed the narrative about the Palestinian uh, fight for and, and the resistance, they make it out to be a, a violent resistance by showing rock throwing, right? Mm -hmm. But rock throwing hard is hardly violence. Exactly. And, you know, these these these, are, <laughs> these soldiers are armed to the teeth with all kinds of uh, body armor or whatever, and 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 all kinds of security around them mm -hmm. that. And same with the, the the police over here. They're 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 completely shielded up, head to toe. They're not not a scratch is happening to them. They're not getting a scratch. I promise you. Yes, there are a few incidences of of a couple of police officers that were overwhelmed by by police uh, by protesters. And I think even in those situations, those uh, other protesters stepped in and and separated the them from actually getting physically hurt. Um, mm. But. You, what you see by them calling violent protesters by throwing that label there, that's a way to discredit the movement and say, oh, you know what, these guys, they're not actually here for, for change. They're actually here to cause disruption, anarchy. Um, they don't really care about it, uh, the actual um, injustice that happened to Floyd, but rather, you know, just cause harm. And and that's important to to notice as as a viewer that we have to we have to sift through the the narrative that's being pushed. Now I'm curious as a, as an American to see what you guys uh, are seeing in the UK as a you know from what you see in the media. 
how is yeah. because I know what I've heard is at least some protests have started even in the UK as well. Yeah, there was a protest today in London, wasn't there? Again, quite a lot of people can just again classed as it was peaceful protest. Um, a fair number of people, but again, it, it's, I think the, the story is such that it has got out into it's a worldwide story. Obviously, now there's going to be worldwide protests, which is exactly what we're seeing here. Um, what JK said earlier on about the fact that I think what we're seeing is because the footage is available, it has made the issue come to the fore more rather than yeah. you know it just being a story or a headline. That footage has been, uh, like, like Madge said earlier, completely viral. So everybody's seen the image of the officer with his knee on the throat of George Floyd. So that in itself has become quite symbolic. And that, yeah. I think, has helped the movement ac across the globe in terms of protest. Yeah. The, 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 other, the other point about um, you know, the, 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 the protests in London and Peckham is that the, what the, the, like the call or rallying call uh, on the placards has been that we are not innocent. So what they're trying to say is that even the UK has had, not as not as much as America, but has had its fair share of uh, you know there be either, whether it be police police brutality or brutality from the authorities, like Mark Duggan example for example. That that you know they're trying to show that this isn't just an American issue. Uh, it's, it's it's an issue that is imp impacting lots of Western countries. And, you know, it's in line with what Madge was saying, that we can't just view it as uh, something that's just in the police authority in America that need to clean up their act and then the, the problem will go away. In fact, this issue has been boiling up uh, for, for decades, hundreds of years, actually, and it is systematic. It's within the system of capitalism. Well, I'm sure we'll go on to discuss this, but right. um, many countries have been impacted by it. It's just that some of the incidents in America have come to the forefront and, and are probably a bit more blatant uh, than, than other countries. It's a bit probably soft, a softer uh, type of discrimination. Now, now in, in capitalist philosophy, okay, let me, uh, let me ask you guys this. Do you find talk from people like Adam Smith related to um, the white people being superior to black people? Do you, do you find uh, tenets of racism within capitalist philosophy when you go take econ um, classes in, in university? Do you find racist um, ideas in their, in their texts? No, right? I mean, no. you, 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 do, you don't find anything related to that. So why is it that these capitalist societies are fermenting racism? Mm -hmm. Structural so, racism. That's the question. I mean, I studied economics at university, right? So um, probably a good place to start is what did I, you know, what, what was my experience of studying economics? Well, we spoke about Adam Smith, we spoke about Marx and others uh, in, in, the, in their, their theories and philosophies and, and, and modern day capitalism today as well. And you're right. There's no blatant, uh, you know, remarks of the white, white race being superior. Um, but... And to, the, to me back then, I would never ever, you know, would never envision uh, capitalism to be a racist ideology. However, uh, learning more, reading more, what you do find is one of the crooks of capitalism is that, uh, you know, there is this difference between the capitalists being superior to the lower class and those that are the labor, the labor class, for example. And who are the capitalists? The capitalists are generically the white man. You know, yeah. when we say the white man, you, can't argue with that. Uh, you know, the white man, sometimes, you know, I used to have discussions before when people used to, you know, I don't know whether you know, but when people say Gora and they say the white man, sometimes it comes across a bit derogatory and like, you know, Muslim can be white. Mm, yeah. But we have to also understand is when, when we say white man, we're not talking about the colour per se. We're talking about those elitists, those that have been at the top of the, the pyramid and have been, uh, you know, controlling the way the world and the order goes. Yeah. And their philosophy has always been, uh, as, as Adam Smith said, is individualism. individualism. So right. they will do what is required for them to succeed and right. at the expense of everyone else. So exactly. this is how and that is, I want the listeners to just pay attention to what JK just said. This is very important in regards to understanding capitalist ideology versus what Muslim, Muslims and Islam uh, 
teaches us, you know. Me, the number one principle in the capitalist ideology, the, the selfish center, everything yeah. emanates from that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that is their creed. That is their shahada. Me, my yeah. interests, and how do I benefit? Exactly. If I if I do something that benefits my neighbor, my neighbor is happy. He'll be happy with me. He won't complain about me. That's not how Islam teaches us to be. Why why we should be caring for our neighbor, right? Yeah, exactly. Because this is the the the, the employer who takes care of his workers gives them a, a raise. He's giving them a raise because they will be better workers for him. You see exactly. see how it comes back to him and himself and how they will be better. A better productivity in his industry, or yep. in his enterprise. Think of him for, right? for for Muslims. Our, our criteria for actions is halal and haram. For capitalism, the 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 criteria is expediency. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's yes. all about me. What can I gain from it? To the hell to hell with the others. Mm. Right. So if there weren't any black people in America, there you th- you think uh, racism or oppression would take place? Absolutely. I it would just find its way to different sectors of, of uh, power, you know, people who are poor and destitute and they're in bad economic situations. They, they, would, they would have been the, 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 the people who bear the brunt of the systemic oppression that's taking place. Just like how um, on, a, on a macro level, we're seeing how in globalism, we're seeing... Uh, Western capitalist uh, governments take advantage of all the various cheap labor that happens all across Asia and Africa, you know, and Southeast Asia. This is, it's the same thing. It's the same thing as slavery, but they just found out, oh, well, you know what? It doesn't come with a negative connotation as of the word slavery, but we're, instead of giving them zero dollars, we're giving them 50 cents an hour. Exactly. You know? And, you know, one of the way first to look at it. Problems. Sorry, go on. Yeah, another way to look at it is whilst the, the theory in capitalism might not be apparently racist, actually capitalism and nationalism is what gives oxygen to racism. Yeah. Because, you know, nation, you know this, these yes. national borders and our national identity and us thinking we're better than someone who is across the other side of the border or even a capitalist thinking I, I'm more valuable than that person who is, a, who is in poverty, that in itself gives the, the very oxygen that creates this, you know, this us and them, creates this racism. You know what? I, I will say that the power structures don't even like nationalists. Uh, ideologies, you know, these uh, these pro uh, ultra right wing mm. um, ideologies that are you know advocating for their superiority over other races, they don't like it because they want their they operate under the sh- in the shadows. They don't want their oppression to be apparent, apparent like that. Yeah. They don't, they they don't want people to understand things like in such you know the pardon the pun black and white um <laughs> way you know they don't want they don't want it so apparent it should be v- very thinly veiled and that's how they usually operate they don't like to operate in a way that where you know the, the well, so, so, operate whether they Europe. like whether they like it or not it's it emanates from their creed no no it emanates from colonialism right Very colonialism good. it laid the way for capitalist industries and, and capitalist societies to flourish right yes of and course. what we're seeing right now is a consequence of what colonialism has done throughout the world where you know um a select group of white men and uh, you know white societies were able to distance themselves from the rest of humanity by a large portion right now there is uh, I would say around 250,000 people on earth who control over uh, around, I want to say 20% of the world's resources or wealth, essentially. 250,000 roughly. Well, I think even in America, if you just take America alone, I think I read a few hundred Americans own something like almost the equivalent of what the American defense budget is per, per year. Absolutely. So, the influence that those people have in terms of like you're right maybe nationalism isn't even the thing for them that for them it's almost that they don't want to be in the limelight as being we're american but they're the elitist that behind the scenes because of that 
major wealth gap that there is and all of these problems that stem from it, they're the ones that are influencing a lot of this. And I think that's part of the problem with protests as well sometimes is because what are you pro who are you protesting you're protesting those same power structures in order for those same influentials to make changes to the very system that they're actually in control of how right. is ever going to how many of those police officers did you see in the protest that were from various different backgrounds of ethnicities i saw asians there i yeah, saw african americans there true. i saw th th these police officers of, of various colors and, and ethnicities so that's that's not the problem. The problem is that these, these police officers are upholding the wealth and the interests of of the select one percent of of society, mm. and even those officers are too dumb to know it. They they don't know what they're even upholding. They're just you know they've given them a uh, a a. Uh, well, Sim, that's called? why I'm hey, glad you some bylines, some, some guidelines of, oh, you know what, you police officers, you're a brotherhood, mm -hmm. you have to get your other, you know, you have to have the back of your other police officer, you never snitch on them. And you, they give them a code and some some sort of fraternity between between them, and then you and then they, they end up becoming um, a shield or a buffer mm -hmm. from the masses, right? Yeah. Well, I'm glad Sim mentioned that point about you know the the idea of the blame is on the police yeah the blame right. is on the police because they're almost that front line to the oppressive structural oppression that is there already so it's easy to blame them but like you said you know in in some of the handbooks and stuff if they're saying you know these are the things you're allowed to do and then once they do them and they get found out for it they're the ones that are having the book thrown at them What's happening yeah. the whole time is that structural oppression that has actually led to that. Even the Black Lives Matter and even those people protesting against people are protesting sometimes for a change of policy within the police. But actually, that's yeah. not going to change anything. Right. Yeah. And, and just imagine for a second, if that 1% of 1% in America, let's just say they were a multitude of ethnicities, um, Black, Hispanic, Muslim, you think things would change? Absolutely not, because the creed of capitalism is still existing within them, mm -hmm. right? The, the creed of my interests, my protection, my industries, those selfish inherent principles are still within them, and they will still continue to manifest the way they do with, uh, with the structural racism that you see play out in society. So. It's not how a lot of the critical race theorists will have you believe that it, it's a, a war between white and black. Mm. It's a war between capitalism and humanity. Humanity and society. And I'm just, just, I think you made a key point, Sim, in that if we look at the history of capitalism and where, it was, where, you know, where the birth of capitalism came from, it did come at the back of colonialism. So at the end of colonialism or, you know, the, the, the historic version of colonialism exists today. It's just a new form. But right. the historic colonialism where there would be a land grab, in fact, that's where capitalism bore itself from. And, you know, how many people know that one of the first products of capitalism or merchant capitalism, which was its, like its early form, how many know that the, one of the first products was slavery? It was, it was you know, the transatl transatlantic slave trade was one of the first products of capitalism. No. So if this is where it was born from, right, if this is the birth of capitalism, then no wonder uh, this racism, you know, racism is part and parcel of that. And the distinction I make is that racism isn't a product of capitalism, because that would be like saying that it never existed before capitalism. But obviously it did. It, it existed amongst the Arabs. It existed even from day one. You know, you could argue that Shaitan was a racist in that, he was racist against the insan. But, you know, we won't go into all of that. But yeah. what I'm saying is racism has existed. But capitalism, what capitalism did, it adopted, it was easily acceptable. You know, nationalist tendencies and um, having that view that one nation or one people are more superior to another people, it adopted that. And, it, right. it, it, it's, you know, it thrives on it. Um, uh, you, 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 you brought an amazing point up with, with talking about Iblis and... and um, his, his racism, because well, racism is a form of arrogance, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, this definitely. is this is, and at least the ultimate crime was his arrogance, right? Mm -hmm. exactly. And uh, when when you see the various branches of 
of arrogance, you see racism and, and some of these uh, um, other um, distinctions that people make amongst each other with related to wealth and things like that, right? So it's not just, just race, but also other barriers people make uh, amongst each other to, to feel better than, than uh, other, other human beings. And why humility and um, asking for forgiveness and these, these values are so much, they're so important in Islam. And it's why, what makes us different as Muslims and why we should take so much pride in, and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us with Islam because um, ultimately it's not just, we're not not only satisfying uh, or meeting, um, hoping to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we're really bettering ourselves at the end of the day. We're, we're lightening our load and we're, we're becoming better human beings at the end of the day. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you know, move, so, you know, if you think back uh, to a uh, famous uh, quote by uh, the late Malcolm X, uh, may Allah reward him, reward, him, reward him Jannah, is when he said that the, the solution for racism in America is Islam. And he said this after he had traveled to uh, Mecca, Medina, after he had traveled the Muslim lands, where he said himself, you know, in a, in a letter to his, his wife, Betty Shabazz, that look, you know, I've sat with the white, you know, with the red and and subhanAllah, he, he, certainly he must have come across the, the hadith of the Messenger وسلم, when he said that, you know, the white is not superior to the black and the, the red to the white and, you know, the Arab to the non-Arab. So, you know, without Islam, you know, when we talk about a, a bond, if you think about uh, a bond that can unite people, there are many bonds and they, all, they will all fail. For example, patriotism. Patriotism as a bond will fail because it only, re- it only really comes into play when there's an external threat to the land, okay? Nationalism will always fail as well because of the fact that, you know, it will even have issues from the structure within, okay? Because everybody wants dominance. So what we can see is that what really can unify mankind, has to, it has to be an ide- ideological and intellectual bond, okay? Now, capitalism is certainly an ideology. It's an, it's an, uh, it has an intellectual aqidah. And from within this, a system emanates on how it does business and how it e- economy and, and, and whatever the rules to how to implement the solutions that it has for man's problems, right? But we see inherently this system is flawed. And the reason why it's flawed is because it's from the aql of man. A man himself is flawed. He's, he's limited. So we see that, you know, Islam is the only deen, the only... Uh, bond really that can unite mankind because it's not from man it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay and this is what Malcolm X, Malcolm X was saying all that time back and I think to be honest with you it's worth discussing now certainly for you know because there may be non-Muslims that are also listening to this podcast the fact that you know we can clearly say that Islam has the solution to racism yeah absolutely yeah. Uh, it's, it's, Islam safeguards and makes uh, distinctions between uh, what is good for you and what isn't what isn't bad for you. The reason why capitalism doesn't have anything to say about um, racism, it's not because that it doesn't care. It's just it, it actually says it's irrelevant. All it, that's relevant is your pleasure. It's made essential truths. Um, it's recognized essential truths like power, pleasure, wealth. Um, these are ultimate truths that. Uh, Certainly, Islam also recognizes, but has parameters around. For for capitalism, there are no power parameters. It's it's a race think, for think everyone. The thing is, same is in capitalism, it only entertains the materialistic value. When it right. comes down to the humanitarian value, the ethical value, the spiritual value, it has no room. It has no place in capitalism. So what you're saying is bang on in the fact that it doesn't even want to entertain this. Yeah. Yeah. And it only recognizes the ultimate truths, power, wealth, pleasure. And how can you attain that? And mm. can, if, if there is, you know, some harm that can happen as a result of, you know, certain things being part of your economy, then you may have to, you know, get, get rid of those, that, you know, over the overall sense of public welfare needs to exist in order for the economy to you know, continue. And something that's actually reminds us of why the COVID-19 will eventually, and if it not already, is being kind of brushed under the rug and it, it needs the, the vehicle, the, the, the wheels of capitalism need to move again. 
mm-hmm. and uh, whatever threat that COVID-19, let's just say, I don't know, there's a lot of debate about the actual threat and, and all that. Let's just say COVID-19 is the worst plague that can be befall humanity. Eventually, forces will come to play that will um, discredit it and, and start blaming uh, other symptoms or uh, things related to COVID-19 that aren't necessarily uh, for the benefit of the public, but because they need to get the economy moving, they're, they're going to discredit it. Even, even in capitalist theory, uh, they talk about cost-benefit analysis, don't they? And, yeah. you know, for them, uh, the life of a human being can be measured. So yes. they will, that will be part of the analysis. And when it comes to that point, and it's already reached that point, when they recognize that actually the economy is going to suffer as a result of the lockdown and, and the fact that shops have to close, uh, they will make that call, even if it means a threat to life and it means death. Because for them, and there's been like senators that have come out and said, you know, I'm willing to die for the system. If, as long as I can, even if I have to go and work and, and, and as a result I get coronavirus and I die, as long as my children and the system prevails and the economic system and capitalism stays intact, that is what is important to me. And that, that's capitalism for you. And, and you know, like Sim saying, this, it doesn't need to dis, be, dis, you know, they don't need to be dis, uh, distinguished in race. As long as uh, the, the parameters is that I'm seeking my own pleasure. And whatever barrier that may come in place, it doesn't matter whether it be skin color or race or the other. Uh, you know, Mexicans, for example, they're not black, but actually they're seen as the other. So there is, it doesn't really matter. Um, so, yeah, I think it is worth dis- discussing how Islam is the only way or the only deen that did, uh, and, and it the history testifies that it, it eradicated racism even though it was entrenched within Arab society. So it was, it's nothing new. It's not like this is a new issue. Even the yeah. Arabs were racist, right? They, they and had it's to- only returned because of the influence. Like, you know, many people can say, oh, well, if you should go to the Muslim countries, you'll see racism completely yeah. take place. <laughs> These institutions, after the, uh, the Islamic institutions were wiped off the map in, in Muslim countries, that is only when... Uh, they were replaced with colonialism, that these uh, things like racism ended up fermenting and taking place in society. And why you see so many issues like um, colorism and, and things take place in our, in our Muslim societies is because of the effect that colonial empires left in our, in our countries. It wasn't as a result of Islam and Muslims. As quite the opposite. You, see, you saw a very nice uh, medley or blend of uh, of muslims all across the various regions of, from north africa to the levant to turkey to all the way to india you see a blend of various ethnicities uh, and, and when you study the muslim populations at least even in in india which is kind of the outer skirts of the islamic empires you'll see so many different ethnicities but you, uh, you know, just, just to yeah, quick yeah, point, uh, just quick point is the fact that you know you said uh, the coloni- when the colonialists left, and I think it's somewhat important is that they never left; <laughs> they, they, they're still there today, and and that's right. the, absolutely that's their exactly. And you know, p- part of that is from you know if people should study about you know communism as well, because a lot of the change in style that came from the capitalist in terms of say, for instance, some of the issues of racism somewhat diminished or some of the pro- social problems in some of these Western nations diminish, often, even if they diminish their foreign policy and their, you know, their oppression elsewhere continues. And that's because often what happened, well, what happened previously is when socialism and communism came on the scene, the capitalists had to change their styles. They had, they, it, was, it was a direct reaction to that. They recognized that, wait there a minute, people, people will warm towards socialism and communism because actually the colonial, you know, direct colonialism is clearly bad. So they had to try new styles to do indirect colonialism or what we call today neo-colonialism, yeah, um, in order to continue that capitalist way of, you know, exploiting the whole world. That ex- capitalism and exploitation comes hand in hand. And that's where racism is born out of that, whether it's part of its political theory or not. 
Actually, you know, just just to point uh, add to that, Rash, the Americans used the anti-colonialist uh, protests within the Muslim lands, for example, mm. to remove the British and French influence, exactly. given though they were number one colonialists, but their style was different. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, the one it's a really interesting point um, because we've discussed protests not really achieving the outcome that people want because you're still asking the existing system for change. Mm -hmm. And a, a system that is rotten will never give fruits that are pure. You know, mm -hmm. you can't seek change through a, a system that, ha that has the, the root of it, which is the root of the problem. Um, so the, the answer really is, is, you know, removing that system and replacing it with an alternative system, right? Um, but someone may ask that, what about, communism what about socialism what about all these other systems uh, you know point less we'll, do, we'll discuss islam but all these other systems that oppose capitalism will they resolve the problem but the reality is if you look at uh commun well, communism when it did have its uh, time for, for a short period mm -hmm. and look at the the previous um, you know eastern european states as well as china who are inclined towards this style, style of th thinking or they were um, they want they're the most racist nations on earth you know, if you go to Eastern European, you can't, if we were to walk in uh, some of these areas, you'd get clear, blatant racism. And if you think about China, China's known to be racist against black people. And, you know, so all these other alternative systems have proven to have this national, nationalist tendency and this tendency to have this superior, this superiority of one race over the other. And it is only Islam that when the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, there's countless examples, uh, you know, if you go back to the Sirah, in which, um, you know, Allah and Islam liberated every person, and the only distinction of man was his piety, his taqwa. taqwa. Mm. And there's this hadith that I, uh, before we had this session, I just want, no, I don't want to paraphrase, I want to read it out, because it's beautiful, and I don't want to ruin it. But the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, Allah most high, has removed from you the pride of the pre-Islamic period, meaning Jahiliya, and it's boasting and boasting in its ancestors. Uh, one is only a pious believer or a miserable sinner. So that's the distinction. You're either a pious believer or you're a miserable sinner. That's the only way that Allah will uh, account you or uh, mm -hmm. you know you be greater than one, one another. And then the Messenger of Islam said that you are sons of Adam, and Adam came from dust. Uh, let the people cease to boast about their ancestors. They are merely fool in Jahannam, or they will certainly be less account with Allah than a beetle which rolls in dung. So the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has clearly outlined, as I knew you also mentioned, you know, in his final khutbah, uh, where he said that, you know, no Arab is superior mm. than a non-Arab. So the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is telling us that it is uh, your taqwa and your piety that is uh, the most important thing. And everything else, uh, whether it be color, gender, Anything else doesn't really matter. And this is what's so beautiful about Islam. And, uh, you know, I'd argue to say that is the only system that eradicated racism. You know, just, just, just to add to that, JK, as a rational remember, many years ago, we was like in university, we were just having a, like a, a circle with some of the students there. And there must have been about 15 at least. Okay. And we were just chatting about the dean and you know what I mean? And, and you got to understand that these are young lads who are away from their homes. They could be doing anything on a Friday night, but they were willing to come and sit with us and chat. And you know, one thing that we just pointed out, we looked around and said, every single one of us was from a different uh, national background, right? Mm -hmm. And it was just the fact that we were there for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing to gain from each other, right? Yeah. And, and this united us in a way which... No one else, I, I believe, can unite in that way. And, and one thing I did say to the guys at, at the time is, you know, people talk about disunity in the Ummah. What I believe is that maybe you guys may disagree. I believe that uh, emotionally, from the heart, we're, we're one Ummah. We're together emotionally, right? What we lack is political unity. And until we don't have political unity, that unity as an Ummah cannot really be illustrated as such. It can by certain events, maybe at the Hajj or maybe Umrah when people go and, you know, you don't see any discrimination, right? But, at, but until the people who are in the authority in, in the Muslim lands, they're the stooges and they're the puppets of, of the same capitalists we're on about. They're there to further show that we're different to the neighboring country. That's their job. And I think that 
you know what was beautiful is the fact that you know that feeling of just meeting a random guy in the street and saying assalamu alaikum and that guy responding you know i, I remember address told me once he used to sell mobile phones and he was uh, like in the middle of a, a shopping center and uh, his colleague was a non-muslim and uh, address was like every muslim assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum right and then the guy said to him he goes no you know a lot of people <laughs> He goes, I don't know. He, goes, he said, I don't know them. They're just Muslims. That guy couldn't. He couldn't. He couldn't understand the point that you know you would approach someone, and you know normally when someone like a salesman approaches, you think, oh, brother, I don't want to speak to this guy, right? You know what I mean? So you're approaching someone, but they're happy to respond, just and they don't even know you. And Subhanallah, you know, for me personally, is you know only Islam can and 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 the reality testifies for this. But fortunately. Uh, the point I made is until we don't have polit- political unity, we can't illustrate this beauty uh, to the rest of the world, whether it's America, whether it's in the UK, you know, they will always feel that even though there's inherent problems in the current system, it's the best thing going. Mm-hmm. Up until the stage, up until there's not a, an alternative model that you can show as an example, unfortunately, you know, uh, I can't see the situation getting better even if people protest they will protest for tweaks only when there's a real model on the other side will they protest and say we want that model you understand what i'm trying to say yeah do you know what i'd agree with Some, someone may argue that there's some inner you know subconscious racism within our communities for example you know what i've found that's come to the forefront of the discussion on, on instagram and on facebook and others is that even in within our subcontinent community um would our parents allow us to marry a, a black woman or, or vice versa, you know, a girl to marry a black husband? And, you know, there may be some sort of intrinsic hate, hatred or, or, or dislike for black or, or of, of the other. Mm. And yeah, it's true. You know, there is there's this, but this isn't attributed to Islam. It's about attributed to culture. It's attributed to previous Hindu culture, perhaps, um, that may be there. But I am inclined to agree with you, Majin, that Without political unity, some of these things are there and they can only be resolved through Islam and a society that's governed by Islam. So the example I'll give you is that, you know, the Aus and Khazraj, yeah, they were the best of the best. They were the Ansar. You know, they, they were the ones that supported the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina. Hmm. But one word of that Jewish boy, you know, who tried to cause disunity within them, they were almost at war with each other. Aus and Khazraj, they've been Muslim. Hmm. Yeah. So when when that one you know inclination of the Jewish boy uh, talking about previous wars they had uh, yeah. and caused nearly caused disunity, that the Messenger system heard of this and came back and said, you know, how can whilst I'm among you, you're going to disunite? What would happen if I wasn't even here? And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed the famous verse: "What tasimu bihabli Allahi jami awwal tafarrahu," and hold on to the rope of Allah and do be not divided. You know that was the verse that was revealed, and what. What that shows is that only through that unity will these any of these inclinations towards uh, uh, one tribe or people being superior to the other will, will, will be removed because our unity will be based on that Islamic bond, as you were saying. So I think that's the, the point. It may exist, but without that unity, without that society of Islam, uh, we won't see it kind of flourish. Absolutely. This is a, that was a great point that you made, JK. Uh, without a doubt, until we recognize the institutions that are in place within our own societies, Muslim societies, and within our minds, how we've internalized core beliefs related to capitalism, that we think that, oh, you know, well, I'm not capitalist. Well, when was the last time um, I helped out someone that that didn't need necessarily, um, that couldn't have benefited me at all, let's just say. Let's just say, um, one of the things that I do um, uh, is I go and I, whenever I'm, I'm visiting a different place in the world or, or in the States, I find out if there's any of my friends who are trying to start a podcast or starting uh, some kind of institution uh, related to Islam up, and I'll see if I can help them out in any way. Not because I need any help from them, but because thinking ideologically and as a, as a Muslim who wants to further the message and the cause of Islam and Muslims, we think along the lines of something 
completely different where we do not try to offer help because we're going to get help later on. I don't help uh, JK out with something because JK will come on to my podcast later on or, and, and help me out with, with financially or something like that. But that's not how Muslims think, but this is how the capitalist mind trains you to think, oh, well, once you, when are you guys going to start monetizing? And when are you going to start advertising? And when are you going to do this and that and that? Because they, we've internalized these values. We've internalized it because Islam is no longer something that provides comfort and benefit to our, our families and our, our core values, but it's become a money-making scheme as well, you know? So it's become a place where we capitalize off of and we've tried to benefit. I'm not saying there are not, uh, you know, added benefits of, of uh, being on YouTube where, you know, YouTube gives you some measure of money or for, for putting up your videos, but... Uh, even that, it's very small unless you're a multi-million subscriber podcast. It's, it's a very small amount of money. I think even the the largest Muslim uh, YouTubers like Ali Dawa and Muhammad Hijab, they barely make anything off of YouTube. So uh, I, I think one, one of the things we have to understand is that um, I have to credit them because many other Muslims who, uh, were, who, who would be in their shoes would be promoting the heck out of themselves, utilizing many kinds of different uh, promotional advertising, you know, other enter enter enterprises that would um, lend themselves to promoting their products and their channels and things like that. But I'm, I'm, I'm not completely against advertising. I, I don't want people to think that, you know, I'm, I'm completely against people making and earning a living, but I'm against people internalizing these values where it's become a basis of their thinking. The, the, the substrate of their, their, their patterns of thinking have become a profit, income, you know, mm. elevating themselves in society to uh, get bigger homes, faster cars, you know, beautiful women or whatever, you know. So th this is, these, these are things that have kind of uh, placed themselves in, in our mind without even knowing. You have to really do some thinking to kind of uh, comb out wherever the, these uh, poisonous ideas have kind of settled themselves in. To be honest, I, to be honest, I think we're all affected, aren't we? Like, we are. We are. Things. And if, if we're, I'd be lying if I had said if I, that it doesn't affect me at all. I, it's a daily thing uh, in how I kind of uh, process things out. And I, I try to think, like, how, how is this how Allah and his messenger would have wanted me to behave in regards to the situation? You should ask the children, you know, like, uh, you know, put up a video on YouTube, for example, and like, or if, even before YouTube, that, yeah, you know, I've gone YouTube, man, you make bare money. I was like, listen, yeah. I'll get one or two views, you know, <laughs> I'm long way, but it's just, like Sim saying, is like, it's just that in the fact that they, they mention that, they link it, even though they know you're doing it for Dawa, but they link it to a monetary benefit. Yeah. It comes from the fact that there's a lot of people on YouTube, a lot of the really, really big people, especially the non-Muslim ones that, you know, seem to do nothing other than record YouTube videos. And I've got these huge houses and cars and stuff mm -hmm. and children at, from a very young age, unfortunately, in this capitalist society are being exposed to that. Mm. And just to broaden the point as well, I think what I was going to mention earlier is what's interesting is even those very people who critique capitalism, critique democracy what they end up presenting because of your point earlier what they end up presenting is a tweaked or a slightly changed version of capitalism or a slightly different version of democracy you know change something rather than thinking you know what a lot of these problems that you know our youth are now facing is a product of this system and actually the only way to alleviate that is to present an alternative system and because they don't know what that alternative system is whilst whilst islam is being alienized and you know mm. shown in a, a very negative light they won't see that alternative system or know about that alternative system a good example of this is there are now non-muslim organizations and people and people who are thinkers saying we should implement the islamic economic system because our economic system is failing, the rich-poor divide is increasing, poverty in the world is increasing, even though we think we're a new, you know, we're the, the, the best civilization out there. Actually, Islam as an economic system was able to 
correct some of these you know distribution issues and islam as an economic system is better than the western capitalist economic system let's try and take that in isolation and somehow try and fit it within the economic sorry the capitalist model and that's just because they cannot see an alternative to solve the problems that 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 are in um, a product of their inherent flawed right, system. Right. Rash, uh, it's it's amazing you brought that point up because it's our own scholars. It's sad to say that within the mainstream scholars who will say, "Well, what's the difference between the Islamic economic system and the uh, the American capitalist system?" And, and it, it's so shocking that they don't understand some of the basic tenets of uh, of what the American capitalist uh, thinking and, and the philosophy behind things is. In, in relation to how they engage with society and how Islam engages with, uh, at least in an in a economic model, right? In how they frame their truths com- uh, related to how uh, transactions take place between humans and how justice and fairness and equality are, are framed in Islam versus capitalist. And then you, you say... <laughs> Then you say like, oh well, I don't understand why you know uh, these Black Lives Matter movements and police brutality take place. Well, I thought you said everything was fair. I thought there was no distinction between Islam, Islamic economics, and um, you know capitalist economics. And, what the, and then now you're saying there's structural oppression because now you see like them just kind of moving uh, from whatever whatever breeze or whatever. Uh, social current is taking them. They're just kind of mm. hopping onto this from one to another, one to another, with no like cohesive argument, no no coherent argument that is kind of put together and offering society. Well, hey, you know what? You guys are in a mess over here, but we as Muslims, we've had this tried and tested method for fourteen hundred years that has uh, benefit for benefited our societies for a large part and has allowed us to coexist with many different ethnicities and, and, and colors and races altogether. No, you don't see any of that. You see, oh, well, you know what? We have to do better as, as uh, our individual skin color and our you know, ethnicities. We have to understand each other better. Completely falling into yeah, the, the traps uh, that, that they want you to get busy with. That Oh, you know what? This is a, a, a war of race and a war of, of um, black versus white, white. It's not. It, it's it's a consequence of it. What what you're seeing this racism is a consequence of uh, capitalism and things like that. But at the heart of it, as as J.K. was outlining earlier, Adam Smith and them they don't talk anything about black versus white, white or white. There might be a little bit of some some uh, uh, some other Enlightenment philosophers who had a couple of racist ideas here and there, but for the most part. There was very little. I think they used. Little, uh, uh, I think they used Darwinism. I think quite conveniently, Sim. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but, and, and still, that that's not the the basis of what their thinking is. No, no. They they're exploiting. They've realized like what is the fastest or the path of the least resistance in society. Well, here are the 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 the, the various areas in society that I can exploit to reach my objective as fast mm. as possible. And that's mm. what it comes to, comes down to with capitalism. Which, which uh, laws, which morals can I skirt by uh, taking advantage of, of these, these holes in the system and, and further benefiting myself? Yeah, I so, think it, yeah. causes, it just causes a massive distraction, whether it's Muslims or non-Muslims. All, of, all these things do, and whether the scholars are contributing intentionally or unintentionally, we don't know what that is within their hearts, but a lot of it causes a distraction so that Muslims themselves start to think, okay, well, that means we can somehow utilize elements of Islam to fix problems that we see today. But in actual fact, it's those very scholars who should understand that the systems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has derived, you know, has given us are holistic. The economic system is linked to the social system. If you try to implement one without the other, inherently, you won't get the values or all of the values that are designed for that divine system in the first place. And I think it's a responsibility of the scholars to clarify that for us. But 
often that doesn't seem to be happening. But Rush, just, just to add to that as well as that, you know, the, the question also might be how many people really understand what Islam is? And or what I mean by that is that if people think about there's a war, if people say there's a war in Islam, people get confused thinking actually, who is it Christianity versus Islam? You know, who, who's, at, who's at war here? Because they view Islam as a religion. But if people could understand that after the fall of communism, the only people who had a, a, a creed, an aqidah, which, okay, it wasn't on the political sphere, but is an obstacle to complete control of capitalism across the world, is in the Muslim lands. So when we see what's going on today uh, and what has been going on, you know, the war on terror, i.e. the war on Islam, what we can see is that, yeah, you know, definitely there's the, the booty, i.e. The, res the resources, the raw materials. Certainly that's something which appeals to the capitalists. But the main reason why we see this ongoing struggle between Islam and capitalism isn't due to ju entirely the resources, is due to the fact that the capitalists, after the fall of communism, I, which was an ideological war, they now know around the world there is only a certain people who don't just have the answers for what's before life and what's after life. They have a complete system that links it into the dunya, which gives you a social system, an economic system, a complete foreign policy, everything. It's just in the Muslim lands. So that's why you know, we, the, the ongoing struggle that we see in Muslim lands as well is due to the fact that the capitalists, you know, the Muslims really are the only obstacle they faced for complete control of the entire world. Mm. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And, I, and we're probably going to come to a close soon. But um, one thing I think audience should take away is that, you know, racism, we're talking about racism today, we're talking about nationalism and, and the other. But actually, I, you know, I don't want to belittle it because it is quite emotional and things are going on. And, and I get it. But, but actually, it's a symptom of many problems. You know, the fact that poverty exists in these areas that are protesting, the fact that there's inequality, the fact that there's continues to be sexism, you know, where they objectify women. All of these are just symptoms of this capitalist problem, you know, the, the problem of capitalism. And when we understand Islam as an idea, as an ideology, and the fact that it's not a set of policies, you can't just adopt the economic policy and then just apply it to capitalism. It doesn't work like that. Uh, as you were saying, that you have to adopt the idea. Uh, the idea of zakat, right? Zakat isn't a wealth tax in that it's just a tax and viewed as a tax as we see in this system, but actually it's something that's in a bother. It's something that we want to do. So without that understanding of zakat, you can't apply zakat on a people who don't understand it. Otherwise, it's something else. It's not zakat. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that all of these issues that we find, uh, whether it be in America or the UK or across the the world uh, per se, right? Um, you know, they're, they're all symptoms of, of the, the underlying issue, which is the lack of Islam, the absence of Islam, which is the truth. And we shouldn't have any, we shouldn't shy away from saying that, you know, mm -hmm. we have the truth. Uh, and only when that's implemented that we'll see these problems. I'm not, I'm not trying to paint a utopia. It's not going to be a utopia, but it is the best system, the perfect system that when applied, even if applied not 100% accurately, will resolve many of the issues. And it's the best system because it's from the creator. I think that's important. Right, you know, yeah. Obviously, we're speaking about capitalism, but any ism other than Islam is bound to fail purely because it's from man's limited mind. And, um, and only the creator can, can uh, you know, provide a system which can actually manage man's affairs in, in, in an optimal way purely because he is the creator and no one understands the creation better than the creator himself. So uh, I think that's, that's, that's a very important point you made there, JK. But, you know, subhanAllah, I think, you know, we've spoken about a lot of things and time is ticking. There's so much to speak about. I mean, we could speak about the war on Islam and stuff like that, but I know that's not the topic. It was leading to that. And I had to get that bit in because, you know, yes, we speak about racism, but, you know, one guy has had his, you know, one guy has been killed. But the reality is, is that, you know, and I'm not belittling that in any way, but, you know, what's happening in the Muslim lands, whether it's in India, whether it's in Palestine, China, uh, East Turkmenistan, in, you know, Iraq, in Syria, it's, it's just, you know, subhanAllah, if we were to do protests, you know, for these incidents, we'd be protesting nonstop 24 hours a day. But that's obviously not the topic for uh, this, this uh, podcast. So, you know, 
to inshallah bring it to a close you know uh, any final comments that you guys want to add to the to the discussion i'll start with you uh, our special guest sim no i just want to uh, emphasize that you know we we work on ourselves first our the the problem that we're seeing with with the the black people in america is is a downfall from the basic family unit the, the black man and women they're, they're being raised in homes that um there's an absent father the, the on every level of society they are being oppressed they have mm-hmm. black leaders have failed them they're in the pockets of of their um uh you know white oppressors um, oppressors you know they 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 are they're really it's it's just a, a game of of exploitation and they they are the lowest common denominator and they're being taken advantage of on every level of society so it's really important that we as individuals we not only work on ourselves but our families and and then so on and we make sure that our basic unit in society our family is strong and we we protect ourselves and we arm ourselves with with strong ideas and 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 be careful of what kind of influences are corrupting our family and of uh, you know how we we guard ourselves from what whatever influences our children are absorbing through media and television and and so on um because it's just a war out there i know just i'm a parent myself and i i battle with my kids about you know how much they use instagram and tiktok and things like that i'm not saying i'm the perfect parent and i forgot it all figured out but we all have to figure out what we can do to best mitigate the harmful impact that uh capitalist societies put on our families so just be sure you you all um, everyone who's listening just think about that for for a little bit yeah definitely man uh the thing is is you know uh, the, the 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 thing is before when when i was growing up um you know it was you would get influenced outside the home but now you know you have people within the home they don't even need to leave the house you know mm-hmm. and they'll be influenced and and the thing is is you can and i think sim just to just to sort of like uh, resonate with your point is that we can talk about this great battle and participating in this great battle uh for domination of the entire world when in fact we might be losing the the battle at home and exactly. uh, and, and and that's something you know th- that we all need to think about and reflect upon um jk any any final points brother the, the, only, the only thing just to add really quickly is that you know with this issue of uh, george floyd uh, i know that um, people have been raising awareness of it and that's great to see like it's good to see that people are uh, sharing it um but one thing that i would ask is that yeah, fair enough, share it and, and raise awareness, but don't let it just become like a bandwagon effect. That when the media speaks about it, when it becomes an issue that's highlighted that everyone's speaking about, you share it. Rather, share it, raise awareness, but also look at some of the deep issues. And as we've discussed, what, what is the root cause of this? Mm-hmm. Look at the deep, try to understand it a bit more deeply and then ask ourselves that, that clear question, what is the actual solution that we resolve? What are we seeking? Are we seeking social justice? Or in fact, are we seeking Islamic justice? And then whether it be for racism or for any other matter, social justice is, is a, a term that's being used, right? But actually, as Muslims, we're seeking Islamic justice, the justice from, from Allah, right? Uh, and that can be implemented in this, this world that we live in. And, and it, it, where, it, where, it, where it doesn't and where, where people get away, they'll, they'll see the ultimate justice from Allah and the hereafter. So that, that's the one ask I ask of people, that look into issues a bit more deeply and don't let it just become a bandwagon. Uh, otherwise, we'll find that we just share issues and don't really look into it uh, deeply. Yeah, bang on, bro. Bang on. And Brother Rush? You know, I say we say Alhamdulillah because at a micro level, we we have Islam that is going to help us protect ourselves, protect our families. And as Brother Sim is saying, is that it's going to allow us to give our children and our families that filter so that we actually protect them from this. But sometimes the issue is, you know, if we just look at a micro level, and don't look at the macro level as well, we will forever be just looking after our own bubble of people or our own families and the, the actual, the, the root cause will never be solved. So mm. I think we need to do a bit of both. 
Yeah, we no doubt we actually make sure our families are protected and somewhat sometimes we do neglect that. So no doubt we protect our children from this. But at the same time, like, you know, these kind of um, avenues like podcasts and like, you know, raising awareness, as JK is saying, we do need to speak out for the macro level solution to these because otherwise it all turns into everybody's message becomes you you perfect yourself you you sort yourselves out and your family out and somehow that's going to achieve um the end goal but actually it's it has to be a bit more than that it has to be a balanced effort of doing the micro but also focusing on the macro and that would be my message yeah subhanallah man the only thing i'd i'd you know add to that really is that as as muslims I think a lot of us have to look uh, into what it means to even to be a Muslim, you know, uh, and, and I've always said this before that, you know, we see people just walking around the streets and living their normal lives. A Muslim is not about that. You know, we, we have, we are the inheritors of the mission of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, we, we are here to bring light to darkness, you know, to bring order to chaos. That is what it means to be a Muslim. It's just, it's, it's just so much more than just, living your own life, just watching your Netflix and, you know, and, and you know, sometimes I say, so if we can, if we can build a, a, a strong connection between the Quran, the Sunnah, look into the life of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, look at the companions. And then, we, you know, if you look at the, we'll, we'll read about Bilal radiallahu anhu, you know, we'll read about him, you know, the fact that the honor, the fact that the same streets where he was dragged through and he was pelted on and he had a, a, a big rock put on his chest, on you know it was those same streets that he was honored with being the first muddin for for islam and you know at the Kaaba. you know this is this is something which is uh, an honor which we can illustrate to the to the people to say look you know islam can do it islam has done it and islam will do it but before that i think we have to really appreciate that we have to understand that and and one thing that i see is that the colonialists you know they may have colonized our lands and left uh, yes, apparently but sometimes I feel that as Muslims we're still colonized in our minds and you know before any liberation is going to come about we need to liberate our minds and you know and, and the point just to say Rash is you know the fact that Muslims only speak about those things that the media wants them to speak about that is showing that you know you're not liberated you're actually being used as a, as, as a tool as a puppet you know, and, and you feel you're doing somewhat right, but in fact you're being played. But you know, this discussion can continue on and on, and uh, you know we have to bring it to to a close. And uh, I first of all, really want to thank Brother Sim. It's been uh, a long time coming, and you know, Subhanallah, everything happens for a reason, and it was just the perfect time with what's going off in America. And you know, Brother Sim was available, and you know, to get his input on this is invaluable. To be honest with you, so first of all, Brother Sim, really Jazakallah Herman. Oh, Yakula, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. It's, uh, yeah, I think it was just the way it worked out. I think this is, was a, a good episode to uh, come on your show with uh, regards to because there's just so much to say. There's so many more things to say after this. Um, I Just buckle up, everyone. There's going to be uh, a bumpy ride for the next few years. I mm-hmm. I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, um, protects each, one, each, each and every one of us and our families and um, the state of affairs of the world it just seems like it's it's going to allow us to talk about a lot of different things. Subhanallah, it, uh, would, it wouldn't be fair to sort of end without you know hearing more about the Mad Mamluks Sim. I you know I know you're doing. Is it still still doing two podcasts a week? Yeah, we no, we do a podcast a week. Um, we used to do a Monday, quite a, bit more, a but, crazy yeah. Monday or, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, Mad Mondays and stuff Mad like Mondays, that. Yeah. That, that, that. We we had to scale it down just because we have regular lives as well and we just were dedicating too much time mm. uh, as i said you know we have to you know, spend on, some time on our families as well and make yeah. sure that uh, you know your your host sims kids don't turn out to be little capitalists <laughs> <laughs> that would be a pie in the face that would be horrible yeah, love protect them. Uh, yeah. so yeah you, you have to balance everything out sometimes you get a your eyes are bigger than your stomach as they say and you take out a little bit more than you want but yeah, one once a week, uh, Mad Mam Looks. Uh, so yeah, guys, check it out, Mad Mam Looks uh, podcast, YouTube. You know, uh, you even got your dedicated website. And to be honest with you, Sim, um, I have to throw this in. And uh, you know, is the fact that 
you know, me and Rush were chatting about podcasts a while back. But what really gave me the go ahead, I'll be honest with you, was listening to Mad Mom Looks. But I, I, I listened just to a bunch of guys sitting there talking about the Dean. And I'll be honest with you, I thought to myself, I even said to Rush, I go, Rush, if those brothers can do it, why can't we do it? You know what I mean? Yeah. And to I me, it was, a, uh, to us, it was a great motivation in Rush. Definitely, without a doubt. Alhamdulillah, man, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. And uh, that's why when Madge told me about it, man, I, I, I made sure that um, I spent some time with him, talking to him about all the different experiences that I've been through. And I wanted to make sure that he's ready for it. Um, and uh, just uh, so many uh, uh, props to you, Maj, because, you know, there's so many ways just to say, you know what, let it be someone else's problem. Mm-hmm. And and even once you get this, I know Maj is working on many other side projects as well, and he's, uh, he's working on um, furthering his skills and skill set, and that's so much more important. You never, ever rest on your laurels. You're always sharpening your craft and wanting to become better in every facet from presentation to graphics to marketing to you know um, the ability to speak and entertain people that's it's all right wrapped up and people just see a guy talking on on camera and and i promise you it, it looks it's so much more harder than it actually looks because when you if, if i could invite some of these listeners who are just you know so easily commenting on, on things and like, oh, well, Brother Sim, you missed that one point. I'm like, yes, obviously, yes, that was something I, I should have said. But like you, it, it, it's um, as, as, a, as a podcaster, I've become more forgiving towards other entertainers and, and other scholars who are in um, uh, media spaces where you have um, a limited amount of time to speak and uh, a thousand cameras on you, a thousand eyes on you, and you have to make sure you deliver everything as coherent and efficient as possible. So it's, a, it's been a learning experience, and I, I'm, I'm just so ha- so ha- happy to have people like Madge around me who I talk to regularly about, you know, whatever the issues that are taking place in the world. So. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And Jazakallah had to my co-host Rush and JK for taking the time out, inshallah ta'ala. I'm sure, JK, you have some Talking Zero products, projects coming soon. And uh, we'll look hard for that. So yeah, jazakallah to all the listeners uh, who are listening or watching this. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and we're available on all popular podcast platforms as well. So for myself and from my special co-host and guest, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget, you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.